what the the what we said uh, two days ago, last time I spoke, was that if we can find what we called an optimal code, optimal being the best possible code that can be constructed, then we expect that to give us uh, a reasonably good approximation for to the Shannon entropy. In other words, we um, well, okay. And, uh, and we also showed that even a single compressed microstate would give us uh, a very good uh, uh, proxy for the, for, the, uh, for the entropy of the system. Now, we showed that for uh, thermodynamic systems. I explicitly used uh, the probabilities from the canonical ensemble. Uh, and it relied, and so, well, I'll come, I'll come back to what it relies on, uh, but it's one thing to say that if you can find a, an optimal code, then it works well, and it's another thing to actually do it, right? So this is the, the usual dichotomy in mathematics of proving existence, which is a great thing, but it's not for physicists, good enough, because we not only want existence, we actually want to know how to do it. Okay? Um, and so what I'm going to show you today is how to do it. And then I'm going to show you, then I'm going to actually show you some results and try to um, give you a sense, try to convince you that this actually has some merit as a physical um, method. And... Uh, and then I'll tell you, you should apply it to everything you do, right? Which is the usual thing that, that, that all, all theorists get very, very enamored of their, own, of their own work. Maybe experimentals do as well. And then we think that you should be able to apply it to everything, right? And so that's what I'm going to tell you too. Okay. So let me just uh, remind you of one, of one thing. So I said that, uh, to repeat myself again, that it's the code word of a typical microstate, and I said typical is, is uh, something which is natural in equilibrium. What it means is, what a typical thing is, is that basically, if I have a big bowl of microstates, each one appearing with a frequency which reflects its probability, and I close my eyes, dip my hand, and I pick one out, and I do it again and again and again and again, they all look alike. I'm never going to see anything which is really, really very different. Okay? That's, in, the, in that sense, uh, the, the, um, there's a sense of typicality in thermal equilibrium. There's no guarantee that that works out of equilibrium. And I specific re specifically relied on typicality when I made the argument that a single microstate is enough to give you a proxy for the entropy, when I said that the difference in the energy of that microstate that I've looked on from the average energy of the ensemble can be approximated by the square root of the variance of the, fluctua of, of the, variance of the energy or, or fluctuations in the energy of that same ensemble. If I take a, a state which is highly, highly unlikely, it'll have an energy which is very, very different, and I certainly can't make that argument. Okay? But as I said, in thermal equilibrium, the, uh, the uh, equivalence of ensembles relies on typicality. Uh, so what I'm saying now is that I want to ask whether we can use this sort of arguments, these sort of methods, in systems out of equilibrium. And then it's, it's, it's a little bit of a... Of a uh, uh, there, there's a real question. We don't have any guarantee of typicality at all. And if, indeed, we find that there is a sense of typicality, that's a result, not an assumption. Okay? So that's an important point to make. So, so that's what I wrote over here, that if, if this thing has any hope to work for systems out of equilibrium, typicality has to hold. Okay? 
And I don't know if it does a priori. Okay, but as I wrote over here, it seems to do really quite well. But that's, uh, okay. Hmm? Yeah. Yes. I mean, you, the only way I know how to do it stupidly, and as, but having not thought about it deeply, is, is you run your process, your equivalent of Monte Carlo, whatever dynamical process it is or whatever it is that gives you your set of states, you run it again and again and again and again and again, and I, and I, and I, and I see what I get. That's the only, and if I, you know, at some point you say, well, look, I've run 10,000 times, it's always the same. I'll, the onus is on you to, to show that I'm wrong, I think. Okay? Okay. So, I mean, what I wrote here is, uh, let me ask what I can hope for, which is exactly the place that everything can break down. Okay? I hope that non-equilibrium systems have, typical, have a sense of typicality and that there is a sense of typical states where if I close my eyes and, and, and randomly draw a microstate, okay, it looks like all the other ones which I would close my eyes and randomly draw. Don't know. I hope so. Um, I hope that the length of, uh, of, of the compressed microstates do indeed give me a good estimate for the Shannon entropy. So it works for equilibrium, but I don't know here. Or maybe not, right? It's also difficult to actually, actually know. We have to sort of look, on the, look, at, look at the equilibrium system where we do understand what's going on. If it doesn't work there, then there's really no reason to believe that it's going to work somewhere else. Okay? I hope that the Shannon entropy is a relevant and interesting measure which gives me information about a system which is out of equilibrium. I know that the entropy in equilibrium is a very important quantity. I don't know that that's true for systems out of equilibrium. Right? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. So, you know, we can calculate everything and see you just get garbage. So it's possible. And even if I'm optimistic about that one, even if I'm optimistic about it, it could be that the signal to noise is sufficiently small that you can't make anything out of it. Right? I could say, well, okay, I mean, I have I've had this, you know, a great God came down to me and he told me this works. Right? But unfortunately, the noise is too much and you can't make anything out of it, right? That's also possible. So these are places, these, I hope that all of these come out the way I want, but every one of them is a problem, it's a potential problem. Okay? I just want to be clear on, clear on, uh, on that. Okay? Because when you're doing things out of equilibrium, you really can't, you can't assume that things are going to work. They do, you're, you're really lucky. Okay. So, as I said, none of these points are obviously, obviously true, but, spoiler alert, it works. Okay? Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving this talk, right? I would have stopped as yesterday and said, this is really fun, isn't it great? And you get a different perspective on entropy, which maybe, you know, blah, 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 but I have nothing to show. Yeah. What did I do? I should change it to the next one or the first one? To the previous. Uh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That is absolutely true. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's, there, there is a, there is a, uh, my guess would be, I would like to see, and I don't know the answer because the systems I'm looking at and I'm going to explain and talk about in a little bit don't have a natural energy. So, uh, but I would believe that if it's typical, it's typical in all the, vari in all the relevant macroscopic variables. But that's a belief, right? So, you know, as I say, that's what non-equilibrium statistical mechanics is not a closed subject. It's not something you learn in a course and you now know everything about it. Okay, you learn in a course and you know a little bit, and there's and, and everything else is, is is to explore, which is why you should all be working in it. <laughs> it's, 
Okay, I put it back. Now happy? Okay, so that's done. All right. So I talked about, about uh, typicality. I talked about the, the Huffman code. And we showed already that the, uh, that the Huffman code is an optimal code, right? But what I need to construct the Huffman code is a priori probabilities or frequencies if I actually want to look at something specific. Frequencies of currents, I'll show you in a second. I have to know what the a priori probabilities of different things are, and I don't know what they are typically, right? In order to construct the Huffman code, for example, of the phrase ar arose by any other name would smell as sweet, I count the frequency of occurrence of the letters. A appears four times, R twice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And then I make that tree that I talked about. I order the letters in increasing or decreasing frequency, and I pair them up as, as, uh, as, as I showed you uh, yesterday, and I get the tree that I get over there, and, and I follow down these, these, uh, these branches, assigning a 1 or a 0 if I go left or right respectively, and at the end, I get a code word for each of the letters, and that's as good as you can do. That's an optimal code for this, for this uh, system. But I needed to know the frequency of occurrence of A, of R, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, if I want to talk about a microstate of a physical system, first of all, it's a large thing, right? We always think in terms of large systems in, in, in the thermodynamic limit is, is, is uh, N goes to infinity, N being the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, I don't have anything like this. And to say, for example, if I think about an Ising model, that the magnetization is whatever it is, that doesn't give you a whole lot of information because the spins can be organized in one way or another way, right? Every state above the, or typical state above the critical point in the Ising model has zero magnetization. They don't have the same energy, right? So they must somehow be different. I, so looking at the level of spin up, spin down, the way I look at the level of letters here, that would buy me absolutely nothing, right? There are things you can do, uh, if you like, which we can talk about, but uh, that wouldn't buy me much. And in any case, I don't know what anything about whatever a priori probabilities I might, I might need in order to set up this tree. So I can't make a Huffman code out of these things. I need to find something, an algorithm, which if I input a microstate or a data string or a picture, or whatever it is, okay? I input a microstate, because I want to talk about physics. The output is a, com is, 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 a, is a file in binary, because you might as well, is a binary file. And I would like very much if the output that I generate in that way corresponds to an optimal code for all the microstates, all right? An optimal, so here I've given an optimal code for a specific phrase from Shakespeare, right? And now I want to give an optimal code for all the microstates, but I can't access all the microstates, right? I can't do that. Again, so I'm going back to the statement that I'd like to see what I can extract from a single guy. So I'd like to have an algorithm which will give me an optimal coding for these microstates. But as I change the temperature, let's say, in the Ising model, my ensemble changes, doesn't it? Right? My ensemble changes. Very low temperature. I have magnetization. High temperature, I don't. Clearly different, right? A typical state at low temperature has magnetization. A typical state at high temperature does not. So clearly, these are very different. I don't want an algorithm which is really good at temperature T equals 1.6, whatever that might be, all right, in whatever units. I want something which works for all temperatures. So really, this is a, this is a, this is a hell of a, of a demand. I want an algorithm which I can put anything in and it gives me an optimal encoding. That's pretty good, right? That exists. Well, it does exist. I mean, it's amazing, and, it, and, and, and these folks, who I gave a shout out to, to, to my home institution for, in the late 1970s, 
uh, Abraham Lempel and the Jacob Ziv, which is not the way you pronounce it in Hebrew, but I can do that if you'd like, uh, came up with a set of algorithms, of which I will speak about two. Uh, and these guys, and I'm not going to do it, they proved, because they're, they're mathematicians, really, they proved that the so-called Lempel-Ziv algorithms, usually abbreviated LZ algorithms, are optimal compression algorithms. That is to say, you put something in, you put it, if I put an ensemble of states in, okay, I get an ensemble of code words out, that is an optimal coding for that ensemble of microstates. That's amazing. That really is amazing. It's optimal in the thermodynamic limit. It's not optimal for a 6x6 six six lattice. Right? In the thermodynamic limit, the lempel ziv compression algorithms give you optimal codes in the thermal, uh, thermodynamic limit for any input, for anything. Right? And that's why these are really, really, really important. These are really, really important. These guys really did something. I mean, really, 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 really. And, 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 and you folks use it when you gzip a file or zip a file or whatever it is you do. Every single time you do it, you're using LZ compression of one type or another and added on Huffman coding just to make it a little bit sweeter. Okay? That's what you do every single time. So whenever, when you zip something and you send it, to, and you send it, send it off, right? because otherwise the, the, the file is too big, you should thank these two guys. Well, you know. You're using their, their algorithm. So it's everywhere. Every single person who has a computer has used it knowingly or not. It's absolutely crucial, therefore, in a whole variety of, uh, whole variety of, of, of industries. I don't have to, I don't have to, to go on and on. I mean, these guys really did something, something remarkable. Okay, so now I, I want to show you, I'll show you two of these algorithms. The first one is, uh, the first one is, is, um, is easiest to show. So let me do it, and let me do it on the board, okay? So if somebody would read me off the letters of that, of that string, it doesn't really matter, but I might as well do it. I can do any, any string. So can, uh, who has a loud voice? Bobo, you have a really loud voice. Read me, and you haven't fallen asleep yet. So read me off. Wait, I got to write them. I know, so you catch up. Okay, let's see. No, I got to keep on going. Yeah, that's true. That's good. You're right. All right. Still more? Oh, geez, I'm an idiot. Is it? Thank God. Thank God. Yeah, this is not a random story sequence. <laughs> I didn't remember if I wrote this, but once when it just started, I knew. Okay, so what these guys said, this is so-called LZ78. It's the second of the, of the algorithms. So I'm going to tell you about L. Lempel Ziv 78 because it came from 1978, shockingly enough, okay? Um, that's the, okay. And what these guys say is the following. They say, look, starting at the left, all right, look at strings as they develop. I want to look at the, I want to look at strings starting at the left. And so my string of first string begins with an A, right? And I'm going to ask whether that has already appeared. Well, nothing's appeared because I don't have anything, right? So I write down, I write down the, the first string which has not yet appeared. And since nothing has appeared yet, right? The first thing which is, is just an A, 
Okay? So A, nothing's appeared. So, a, so I just have an A. My first word, which I'm going to put in a dictionary, is just A. All right? What I'm going to do now, I'm going to put a comma here just because to keep my place. That's what I did over there. Okay, now I, I, I look now over here and I say, okay, what's the first thing which hasn't appeared? Well, it's B because it hasn't appeared. Okay, keep going. Well, A has appeared, right? A has appeared, but AB hasn't yet appeared, right? B. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So B has appeared. B A, B A has not yet appeared, right? A B has, but B A hasn't. B has appeared. B A has appeared. B A B hasn't. Okay. B has appeared. B A has appeared. B A B hasn't. B A B B A B has, sorry. B A B B hasn't. Right? A has, A B, A B A, I don't think has. Right? I'm just doing my thing over there. B has appeared, double B hasn't. I mean, double B has appeared? No, it hasn't. It has, it's not my dictionary, is my point. It's, sorry, excuse me, when I say hasn't appeared, I should be more precise. It doesn't appear in the dictionary that I've generated. I stopped writing the dictionary because they're already written over there. So I didn't see any reason to do it again. Okay? So BB has not appeared in my dictionary yet. So I'll write it down. There it is. There it is. Okay. A has appeared. AB has appeared. ABA has appeared. This guy has not. I'll put that in my dictionary. And I somehow I seem to have gotten... I think there's, there's, a, there's a missing B over here. There's a vanished B. Is there? Yes, there has to be. Uh, doo, 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 doo. Well, okay, let's just look over there, because I don't, I mean, this is sort of funny. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't matter. I can, I can just end it over here if you like. Then we're done with that particular, I mean, there, there I'm finished. Okay? Um, or I can just now look at this thing here. So what I do is, Every time I see a phrase which doesn't appear in my dictionary, I put it in my dictionary, okay? That's what I do. And all those, those words in my dictionary written in purple over there, and I give them a number, right? I give them a sequential number, the first word, the second word, the third word, etc. But you can see all I've done is I've partitioned up my string with commas or some such thing. So why does this help in any way? Well, the reason it helps, in other words, I mean, it's called data compression. It means I want to give you a shorter file, right? I want to encode this string in a shorter file. Otherwise, you know, not really doing very much. So how have I done that? Well, the way you do it is, is the following. What I do is instead, when I am writing word number one, I code word number one, okay? Well, let me put it this way. I code a word in terms of the the prefix that it has up to the last letter, and then I tell you what the last letter was. Let me give you an example to make it, to make it clear. So um, here's one. Uh, word number six is B-A-B-B. -B -B. Okay, it's word number six. That is the same as word number five, B-A-B, -B, here they are, with, an, with, a, with a B appended at the end, right? Um, number 10, word number 10 is B-A-B-B-A, -B -B -A, so that's B-A-B-B, -B -B with an A appended, okay? Now the point is the following. The point is the following. So the A, the first one, there's, there's no word for it, so I just put a zero or some, or some symbol which tells me it, it's, it's not part of, I'm not referring in the dictionary to anything, right? Or I'll put a blank in the dictionary, whatever it is you want to do. Um, okay, A, in, in the case I'm giving you here, which is a, bi it's a binary thing, there are two possibilities, A or B, right? Uh, that means, so A or B, to tell you, if I, if I tell you if it's an A or a B which is appended, that takes one bit of information, right? It takes one bit of information, it's a binary choice, okay? The words over here, sorry, the, the numbers of the words, 
okay, like seven. I can write down in binary, binary with log seven base two, uh, pretty much, uh, characters, right? I mean, and so what I can, what I, what I gain is the following. I, I, I know that for all of the words in my, in my, in my dictionary, okay, all the words in my dictionary, I'll write out, down as the binary, represent, binary, binary representation of the, of the word which it refers to, of the number of the word it refers to, okay? I need log number of characters to do that. And I need a single character to tell me what comes next. All right? So let me imagine I have that the number of, 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 uh, of, of um, phrases in my dictionary is C. Okay? So let C be the number of phrases in my dictionary. Then I number them from 1 to C, right? Correct? I number them from 1 to C. I have C phrase. Here I have 11. C is 11 in this case. Right? So... I have C phrases in my, uh, in my dictionary. Actually, C is 10 because this just, re just, just reproduces. Um, so C is 10 over here. 10 phrases in my dictionary. Okay, that's, so C equals 10. To write the number, the word number for any one of them, takes at most log C bits, right? I write them in binary. Takes at most log base 2 of C bits, okay? I need another bit to tell me if it's an A or a B at the end, okay? And I need to write, and, I, and I'm sending this, this, uh, this code out, right? I'm sending this code out, and I have to tell you, I have to give you uh, a, 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 a sequence of C terms referring to the whole sequence. Is that clear? Okay. This guy? I, I, just, I just label the words in the dictionary sequentially, that's all. Okay, and, I, and, and in the end I, I have, it turns out the number is, I'll call the number of phrases in the dictionary, words in the dictionary, I call it C. Okay, for the given, given sequence that I'm, that I'm looking at, which is that. Okay? And I'm saying that I'm going to refer, that when, in write, in when I, when I want to say B-A-B, -B, I'm not going to write B-A-B, -B, okay? I'm going to write... 4, 4B, I think is what it is, right? I'm not going to write word number 5, I'm going to write 4B, okay? And what I'm saying is that the largest, the, that if I want to write uh, something which refers back to the, to, to, uh, to, the, to the biggest word, referring back to it takes me log of the total dictionary length, that's log of C, and I need one to tell me what comes after as a, as, as a suffix. That's the whole deal, okay? And I have to do that C times, okay? Because I have C things, and if I, add, if I just send these things sequentially, you, you can decode it, okay? That's the, whole, that's the whole point, okay? So instead of, so, so the string that I'll send you won't be this, okay? It'll be, it'll say, okay, zero A, and I'll say, okay, zero, there's nothing. I interpret the first guy as an A. Okay, zero B. Okay, I interpret that as a, as a B. My first word is A, so because I, I've already decoded that, right? My first word is an A. So here, this one says, okay, go back to word one. That's an A. I look at my lookup table, add an A to it. Okay, and this guy here says, go back to the second word. Second word was a B. Add an A to it. So this is a B A, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you deco decode this thing. Okay, and the point is, as I said, that this, the length of this thing is, is less than or equal to the number of words in the dictionary C log base 2 of that same number plus C because this is telling me one bit of information per guy in the end if it's an A or a B, which has to be appended to it. So this is not particularly hard to show, and this I will leave for homework, okay? I'll leave for homework. Suppose I have a random... Okay, suppose I have a, a periodic string. One, 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 okay? 
So my first word is one, the second word is one, one, then one, 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 then one, 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 one. It's not very efficient, but nonetheless, you can you see how it goes. Okay? You can easily compute if I have n of the length n guy, right? N ones in a row. If I have length n guy, you can easily show that the number of phrases that you need goes as the square root of n, and you can do that. Don't do it now. All right? So per character, the information theorists would say, okay, per character, I just do c log c. That's c square root of n log square root of n, right? That's square root of n log n. I don't really care about this, plus that, square root of n. Uh, so the per character guy I divide by n, that goes to zero, which means the thing is, according to the way they think, they would say zero entropy, okay? Asymptotically, okay, the per symbol thing. So that compresses rather well. There are much better ways of doing it, okay? Just to, just to give you a sense. The other thing is I want you to show for homework that if I choose something which is random, Okay? Random ones and zeros, coin flips, Bernoulli sequence. Okay? I want to show that you can't compress at all. You cannot compress it at all. Okay? The length of the sequence that you're going to send to me, having applied this algorithm, is the same length as the, as the original thing. Okay? And the way you would show that, just to give you a, a little bit of a hint, is you have to ask how many, you, you, if the thing is, is, is actually random, right? Then you sort of expect that every short word is going to occur, right? The best you can do, as a matter of fact, is if all the words, the random words, of up to whatever length you need, show up. What's the length that you need? Well, the, the total length of the, se of the sequence better be the number of characters you sent me, right? And then you can calculate the, uh, the average length, okay? And you can, it's not particularly difficult, in fact, it's right over here. I'm not going to tell you how to. I'm not going to do it for you. Just let you, just to, just to give you a sense of it, the uh, the number of of terms in your dictionary is the sum from k to some maximum, which you have to determine some maximum length of two to the k. Because for every, if I have a word of length k, there are two to the k possible words, right? So I want to say that every short word occurs, and then the total length of your sequence is going to be k times two to the k summed as well. This is a known quantity because I know how long my sequence is, and, uh, is uh, a priori. And that, this gives me a way of calculating this upper limit on the sum. Plug it into here and, and check that what I said is right. It, it is. Okay? Okay. So what that means is that a random sequence doesn't compress. Okay? Yeah. How do I compose the dictionary? Well, so I just, I just, I just starting, starting from the first phrase in the dictionary, I, I number them sequentially, okay? Since I built my, my the one of the, the nth phrase, okay, refers back to an earlier word in the dictionary with an appended A or B, that's what I send. That's the way I do it, okay? Um, yeah. Here's another way. This is a different... Uh, this is LZ77, which is, which is better for, for lots of things. Well, you have to be really, 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 really long to see the difference, but yes, you'll see it. If it's long enough, you'll see it, sure. So the random sequence is periodic. I don't care. I got time. <laughs> right? I mean, if, if you're asking if I have a... You know, if I have a, uh, a, sh a sh you know, a, a short sequence from that, yeah, it'll probably look pretty random, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Take? Yeah. Uh, usually nothing. The only reason anything would happen is because you've, uh, okay, that's, that's sort of a funny thing. All right, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So, so let me just tell you, I'll, I'll, let me answer that right after I tell you about this. All right? So this is a, a second way of doing compression, and there are more. Uh, but I'm just going to give you two of them, and that's, and that's really enough. Okay, again, it's going to be a dictionary that's going to be composed. All right? Um, but now it's going to be done a little bit differently. And I, this is really uh, poorly written. But what I'm going to give you instead of, so what I gave you here, to, when I, I, I gave you each, each of these words, 
I wrote down as you know, the number of the previous, of, of the word I'm referring to, and then a character, either A or, or B, right? I sent you pairs, right? I sent, I sent pairs in my, in my sequence, right? This, followed by this, then I do that again and again and again until I've exhausted my sequence. I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I'm going to send you triplets. And, and again, this is not the most efficient way of doing it, but it's, but it's easiest to, to understand. And, and it, I hope it'll be clear in a second because this is probably not at all. Okay? So I'm going to send you a triplets, which are, which are going to be, I'll indicate by P, L, and C. Okay? P is going to be um, the, the position in the part of the sequence I've already looked all right, of the longest match which I'm about to undertake, okay, that match, it's going to be clear in a second, that match is L letters long, okay, and it's followed by something new, an A or a B, okay, it's followed by something new, okay, and I want to tell you what it's followed by, the, and thereby I build a, a new word in my dictionary if you like, okay, so, let me just show you how to do it because it's just easier to do it. So here's a string uh, which is different from the one. This one I couldn't, I couldn't just compose in before Faster Than Blue Book gave it to me. All right. I start with a cursor. There's the string is up on the top. I start with a cursor on, on the left. All right. And I'm looking to the right and I say, okay, what's, what's, what has been seen? The answer is absolutely nothing. Okay. I move the cursor over one and I, and, and, and well, yeah, sorry, I haven't moved the cursor yet. I'm looking for the longest match in my dictionary. My dictionary doesn't exist, okay? So there's, uh, there's no position of my, of, 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 for me to refer back to, right? PLC, no position. The length of the match is zero because it's no match at all. And I am adding an A over here, right? So I write this first A as some character which indicates that there's nothing there. Uh, no le length zero and an A. So that doesn't help me much, right? Okay, I move the cursor over one. Now I look forward and I say, okay, A has occurred. A, B hasn't. So A has occurred. Uh, so I write this now. Uh, I go back one. So where is the position relative to the cursor where, uh, where I have some sort of a match? The longest match I have is A because the only thing which I have. I go back one relative to the cursor, right? So that's the one over here. I copy one character, it's the A. Here it is. And I append to it another character, which is a B. Now that's covered the red guys over there. It's going to become a little bit clearer as I go. Here, now I move the cursor to after the, the, the word I've, already, I've, 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 uh, I've just coded. And I say, okay, fine. I have an A, B, 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 whatever, going. A I've seen, but even more, I've seen A, B. Here it is. Where did it start? Two to the left of the cursor. There's the two. How many characters long was it? Two. A, B. What did I have to add to get the new word? Another B as it happens. So I write two, two, B. And that brings me to here. Okay? And I, now I'm looking again. So B has appeared. That's fine. B, A has appeared. B, A, B has appeared. B, A, B, A hasn't. All right? So the length of the longest thing which has already appeared is BAB. Sorry, excuse me, that, that is, is 3, which is BAB. Where did it appear? 4 to the left of the cursor. I go 4 to the left of the cursor, copy 3 guys, that's the BAB over here, and add an A to it that gives me that, and I go on and on. And when I get to something like this, I have ABABBABB. If I go back 9, I see that I get everything that appears here except for the final B. So I, so I go back nine, copy eight, and add a B to it. And this is how I generate my, my code. Okay? What I do is, I don't send you this, I send you these guys over here. All right? Now the advantage in something like this is that when, when I have something, it doesn't make a difference if the system is, 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 uh, is completely random, but if it's ordered, I do much better with this than I do with the previous code. Well, there are, there are also other ways of doing it which, which improve on this as well, but yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so what I'm so, okay, so this is the guy over here, right? It's, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to code BABA, correct? After, after ABB is A, after A, where am I looking? I'm not sure where you want me to look. Over here? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. But yeah, but I'm saying is, it's true. But BAB already appears. Right? That, that, that phrase already appears. Doesn't it? And if we're, it, start, it appears four back from the cursor. All right? I, so, I, so I don't want to copy that whole phrase. But I want to copy the first three four back from the cursor. All right? And there are ways of making this more efficient. I don't want to get into it. The point is, once again, this gives you a... Uh, in, in the, both of these guys give you optimal compressions in the infinite system limit, the large system limit. One point I want to make is that this... Is a, these are pattern matching things. Okay, they look for patterns. It's, it's not... These guys will not compress the binary expansion or even the non-binary expansion of, let's say, pi. Okay? If you have pi, it's not gonna, these aren't going to do a damn thing, and yet the Kolmogorov complexity is very low because there are efficient ways of generating the first whatever number of, of, of terms of, uh, in, in pi that you like are. Okay? So this, this is not a measure of simple, of which always gives you something and tells you something is simple. Right? Whereas Kolmogorov is... This is really something, though, that I think is good for us as physicists because we are, the systems we look at, it, they, are, they derive from some sort of physical process, either because of energy or because of some other things which I'll get into in a few minutes. And what, what we see in these systems are patterns. So this is great for us, but it's not good for saying, you know, is, is, is pi, you know, okay, I'm going to send you first two million things of pi, let me do it this way. It won't be very good. Okay? So it is not true that anything with a small Kolmogorov comp complexity compresses well. It is not true. However, I don't think we need to care about that because as physicists, we're going to be looking at systems where patterns are the deal. Okay? We're not looking at something really, really strange. Okay? Good. So the point is that these, uh, these algorithms are, are, are asymptotically optimal, meaning in the thermodynamic limit, but the caveat is, because it's always a caveat, the caveat is that the convergence is slow. Okay? Something like 1 over log n. Right? 1 over log n, that's real, that, that's, so that's not very happy, right? right? 1 over log n means you're, if you want to actually do something stupidly, you really have to go to really, really big systems, right? I mean, really, 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 really big systems. That's tough. Okay? I'll come back to that point in a little bit. But this is in the interest of full disclosure. Okay. So, so now let me, I want to show you a few, some, some results. And to do that, I'm going to have to show, show, show you a few models. Okay? So my goal is to study non-equilibrium many-body systems using data compression. Okay? I want to look at the compressed, the, the, the length of compressed microstates and I want to say, this is a measure of, of I want to claim that this is a proxy for the, for the Shannon entropy. Don't care about the fact that the thing converges quickly or slowly or whatever the thing. I'm just going to throw this out to you, all right? And let's see what we get, right? We've already, I've already told you that, that things don't have to work out of equilibrium. May not be typical. Signal to noise may not be good. Finite size effects may kill you. And, 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 the, and the compression may show you absolutely nothing of any interest as you look on, you know, when, when you study it. It may just give you nothing, right? You can, maybe you can calculate it perfectly and it doesn't do anything. It's just not interesting. Also possible, right? All these things are, are possible. Okay, so let me show you a couple models. And I'm going to look to start, I'm going to start off by looking at absorbing state models, just because I like them. Uh, so here's a model uh, called the Manna model. I believe Manna is at, uh, is at Kolkata, if 
I'm not mistaken. It's a lovely little model. And here's the model. It's simply defined. Okay? It says, did I get it right? It says the following. It says, let me start out with a lattice. I'll choose a square lattice. I'll, so let me start out with a square lattice. You can do this in whatever dimension you want as well. I'm going to talk typically in one and two dimensions because I don't know how to draw three and four. And, uh, and just so you won't think I can only do one-dimensional things. That's the general idea. Okay? Two-dimensional square lattice, n by n, whatever it is, right? Large. Uh, I'm going to close my eyes and throw particles down onto that lattice and um, with some density, okay? Some number density of particles. That's what I do, all right? I need two things to describe active uh, absorbing state models. One is I need a notion of activity, okay? Absorption is the absence of activity, all right? I need a notion of activity, which I'll tell you in a moment, and I need to tell you what to do dynamically once I've identified something as being active. Those are the only two things I need to, do, to tell you. Those define fully an uh, um, absorbing state model. I'm going to give you several absorbing state models today. And just bear that in mind. I have to tell you two things. What does active mean? What do I do if, to active particles? All right? What does active here mean? It means more than one in this particular example. You can choose more than whatever number you want. More than one particle in a box. Okay? That's definition for this model of, 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 of active. Okay? So all the red guys are active. And now the question is, what do I do with my active guys? So the guys who are not active, I leave where they are. They're, they're happy. They don't do anything. They're not going to move. All right? They're not going to move. So all the active guys are going to do something. And what they're going to do is, at every time step, I'm going to empty an active site, the box. I'll empty this box, let's say. And I'll distribute all the particles in it, left, right, up, and down at random. Okay? There are different rules that you can, that you can give for this. But that's one rule that you can give for this. Okay? I'll take, I'll take everything out and just spread it around as near neighbors. And you know, at random, okay? So if I do that, the first step, so these guys, the way I've just decided to do it, are going to move in this following, in, the, in this fashion, okay? There they go, all right? I still have some active guys. They'll, they'll move again. I've just chosen this at random. And eventually, in this particular case, I come to a state where there are no more active particles, right? The dynamics ends, right? There's no more dynamics. The, the thing is finished. That's an absorbing state. That's why these are called absorbing state models. Everything is done. Okay? Now, yeah, okay. Let me tell you what happens. As a function of density of particles, all right, what I want to do is I want to look at the active fraction, the fraction of particles which are active in the system. All right? That's what I want to look at. And I'll tell you the following. In, in the final state, all right? In the final time, let's just go as long as, I, as long as I can. If I have a very, very low density, what do you think the active fraction, after I wait long enough, is going to be? What is it going to be? I'll give you the answer. Zero. Not all at once. Zero. Right? They're going to all somehow find a way of getting, getting away from one another, right? And this is just perfect, right? This is exactly what you want. This is a model for happy coexistence in a neighborhood, right? You just stay away from everybody else, right? This is just the malevolent or the, the whatever the... That's not the right word, but there's a word. I know there's a word. Well, no, no, but here... But, oh, yeah, yeah, if I, go, if, I, if I put too many in, you mean? Ah, yes, okay. In that case, there's nothing I... Well, in, in, in that case, if I have too many, clearly there's, there's some limit. If I have more than the number of, right, of, uh, of lattice sites, then there's nothing I can do. It has to be active, right? The question is, right, is it less, right? That's the question. And so here's the answer. Yes. This is... Now, you guys, how many of you... And this time I want a real answer, because I don't get an answer, I'm going to go one, you know, one, 
right? It's not going to be like, shoot, I'm asking the question yesterday and every, nobody's saying anything, right? And I know full well you had no idea why there was a square root of KT in front of the noise, okay? And there's no, right? If you're honest, right? Okay. Who has seen the phase diagram for the two-dimensionalizing model? If you don't raise your hands, I'm just, I'm going to go on, you know, you're going to skip lunch because I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. No, I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait. I said, who has? Who has? Two people have seen the, 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 who knows what the Ising model is? Who made a mistake by coming here? You guys know, okay. Have you seen, have you seen, you know, the, the Ising model? I'm not going to be like Sanat and, and really say it, though he uses, because that's just not my personality, right? You guys don't. What's the order parameter of the Ising model? Magnetization. Good. What happens below the critical? What's the magnetization above the critical point? I can't hear you. Come on. Zero. What's the magnetization below the critical point? Not zero. I'll give you because I that's you know. All right? Good. So if I look at the right temperature magnetization. Okay, zero, not zero, right? Does it look like that, sort of? So it's a reverse, we don't care, right? This picture sort of resemble that? Am I, did I lose everybody? This sort of looks like that, right? Is the phase transition of a two-dimensional Ising model, first order, second order, third order, fourth order, 75th, 2891st order, what is it? Is it first order? Who thinks it's first order? Who doesn't think it has a phase transition? Who wishes he or she were somewhere else? Aside from you and me. Who thinks it's first order? Who thinks it's second order? That's the right answer. Who thinks it's second order? I'm going to help you along. Come on, if I tell you the answer, you don't raise your hands. Or <laughs> when I increase it, I don't care. You can either way, you do... I don't know. Who's changing field? Zero field. Who is that? Field? Good God. Make my life difficult, why don't you? No field. Zero field. <laughs> Zero field, two-dimensionalizing model. Second order. How do you know it's second? Yeah. You're, you're not guessing, saying second order? Yeah, yeah, it is. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> it's good. It's true. It is. He's right. How do I know it's second order? Well, lots of different ways of knowing it's second order, but one of the ways I know it's second order is that my order parameter rises from zero continuously. It doesn't jump. All right? That's one of the ways that I know my order parameter. Sorry, my, 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 uh, my, my phase transition second order. What other things are true for second order phase transitions? There is a diverging who wants to be picked on. Diverging what? There are two possibilities. Two right answers here. Got both of them. There's a diverging length scale, which is called a correlation length, and a diver over which things are correlated, right, which is hence the name, and a diverging time scale, which says, as I try to equilibrate my system, as I get close to the critical point, it takes a really, really, really long time. So if you're not really smart at Monte Carlo, you're never going to get the right answer. You can overcome it. Okay, but you have to know Swinson Wang or Wolf algorithm, stuff like that. Um, okay, so second order phase transitions. Okay, so continuous change, continuous change, if you like, of order parameter. Of order parameter, right? Diverging length, scale, scale, usually written psi, called the correlation length, and a diverging time scale, usually called tau, at the critical point. Okay? Those are the things to look for in a, in a second order phase transition. There are other ways of saying you can also talk about singularities in the thermodynamic functions or the derivatives, okay? That's also true.
Say again. Yes. Yeah, this is, a, this is at large times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the thing has asymptotically has gone to steady state. Yeah. Yeah, you, you follow this thing, it has a decay or, or a rise, and then it flattens if it's on the right. Pardon me? It is, the, the fraction is independent of lattice size up to finite size effects, obviously. Up to finite size effects, obviously, right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what's the point here? So you said that above maximum filling, I have to be active, right? And you're right. But maximum filling is density one, right? And look where this thing is happening. This thing is happening at around 0.69 or some such thing, all right? Actually, 0.68, whatever the hell, all right? I'm way, really far away from that one that you're saying is my wall that I, that I, that I can't exceed, right? So what this is telling you, listen to this, guys, because this is really important. This is telling you that at some critical density, although there are many, 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 and I can go on with the many, 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 many absorbing states, which I can put down by hand, right, in between this critical point and one, which is over here somewhere, I never find them. My dynamics never, ever finds them. Okay? That's really weird, right? That's the nature of this non-equilibrium phase transition. And now you can say, why does it happen there? I mean, why does it happen at 0.7? Why does it happen at 0.6? Right? Why does it happen at 0.9? And you know what? I have no idea. And not only don't I, but no, nobody else does either. Okay? When you talk about Equilibrium phase transitions, you know why the, the phase transition occurs where it occurs, right? I've got energy pulling one way, entropy, pull, entropy pulling the other way. The free energy is E minus TS, right? When this guy's pulling one way, okay, energy pulls, I get ordering. Entropy pulls stronger. I get something which is disordered according to the usual incorrect terminology, but I'll use it anyway because you understand what I mean. And I understand why the critical temperature is where it is. Pretty much, right? I have no idea what's going on over here. And that should not bother you. That should really, that should really make you happy. Because this is something which is really fundamental, which we don't understand. We don't understand why the phase transition occurs here. We don't understand what's going on, right? And we don't understand something in physics. That's when the excitement is, right? I mean, if you know everything, who cares, right? Okay, that's just a, uh, good. So this is just what I said. There's a diverging correlation length. I'll even show you what it is. There are actually different ones. Uh, and let me give you a very quick digression on, 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 on because I don't have any, as usual, I, I talk slowly, uh, on hyperuniformity. So here, this is cultural, this is a cultural point, all right? There's the, Ga the Gauss circle problem, okay? This was uh, a problem that Gout, shockingly enough, suggested, okay? He said the following. He says, he asks, let me take a square lattice, and I want to put a circle centered at the origin. Origin is obviously any lattice point, uh, and has a radius r. How many lattice sites are inside? Okay? So it can't be a stupid question because Gauss asked it, right? And, the, and, and so the answer is, well, it's pi r squared if I have unit, uh, if, if my, if my um, distance between lattice points is, is, is unity, which I'm going to take to be, all right? So it's pi r squared plus some error, and it turns out and I'm gonna, not gonna, that the error is something like the square root of the radius, all right? And the reason the error is the square root of the radius is because stuff which is already in the middle of the circle is there, and the only difference as I change my radius a little bit in or out is stuff which comes in from the, through the surface, right? Through the, through the circumference of the circle, that scales, right? Um, that scales as R, and I get a square root of R because of the, some randomness going on there, okay? 
The related problem is what happens if I take that same circle, and I'll give it a radius L, and I move it about in my lattice anywhere I want to do it. To do that, obviously, all I need to, to, to do it in is a unit cell. What are the fluctuations in the number of lattice points that I see? And it's the same answer, okay? The fluctuations in the number of points in a, in, in, in a, uh, in a circle of of size, uh, size L, as I move it around everywhere on, the, on, on this lattice, fluctuations being indicated by the variance, scales as L in two dimensions. If I'm interested in the density of points, that's the number of points divided by the area, all right, that scales as L to the minus three in two dimensions in general, in any dimension uh, for a periodic system the variance of particle number scales L to the D minus 1, again, coming from the surface, okay? And the density is just uh, L to the D down from that, okay? Um, just because of normalization. Okay, what happens? And if I plot this, if I plot the density, the, the, the variance of the density, I could have done the variance in the, in the numbers. It doesn't make a difference. If I plot the, de the variance of the density, on the log log plot, I see the power law very nicely. It does just what I said it does. Okay, and the reason the reason I'm showing this to you is because I want to contrast it later on with something else. All right, log log plots show power laws. Right? We all know that. Power law, log log plot, exponential, log linear plot. Right? Good. Suppose I have a random distribution of points. If I have a random distribution of points, the variance in the number of particles as I move that same circle around. Okay, scales as the number of particles in, as the area of, the, of, of, the, of, the, of that circle. It doesn't have to be a circle, by the way. Okay, any, your favorite, you know, Pokemon shape will, will work. Pokemon shape will work. Sorry. My kids are not that young anymore. Um, so that... That variance in the particle number goes as the area, or sorry, the volume that you have, which is, and the volume goes as the number of particles inside. And so therefore I get uh, the famous square root of n fluctuations that you all know about, right? Because the square root of n comes when you take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation, right? So random things always give you square root of n fluctuations, right? Right? God, you guys are either sleeping or you're just so, so polite or the force of my remarkable personality is just uh, too much, carries the day. As long as my girlfriend doesn't hear that, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, if I do the same trick, plotting the density uh, variance, density fluctuations as a function of size of my circle, I, I, once again, I get a straight line if an analog log plot. However, my power is different. It's what I said. Over there. This was written over there. Okay? Now, the question is, uh, here's my question. Um, suppose I want to get a very, very highly uniform distribution of points. A square lattice is really highly, any lattice, any periodic thing is very highly uniform, right? It is, right? What's easier? If I give you 10,000 coins, all right? What's easier to make? A random distribution of, of coins on the floor or a periodic lattice? You guys, it's not a trick question. The lattice is easier to make? It's easier to make a lattice. It is. Which is going to take you more time? By easy, I mean time. When you get past a certain age, everything is measured in terms of time. Which will take you less time to make? Yeah, how do you make the random one? I take the thing and I throw it across the floor, right? I mean, that's what I do, right? Periodic, you sit down and you go, uh-oh, this is a little bit off. Let me move it back, right? That's hard. Question is, question is, so say, okay, fine. I'll, I'll, periodic is really great. But I mean, I'm willing to go, I'm willing to just accept something else. How can I, is there any way I can make a distribution of points, okay, whose fluctuations aren't the square root of n fluctuations. The variation is not the very square root of n, which is the random thing that you've just given me by tossing the coins in the air and watching where they fell. 
right? Can I do it? This is actually an important problem, all right? I mean, I can, I can tell you by measuring it whether you've done it, but how do I actually do it, right? So there's a real question there, okay? Is there any way to do it? Um, you can't, so you say, well, uh, you know what? I got a great idea. I'm going to take a system of particles. I'm going to take a system of particles. I'm going to give them some energy, right? I'm going to give them some, some energy, uh, and I'm going to watch, and I'll let the thermodynamic equilibrium take over, right? And that ought to do pretty well. And it does do pretty well, but it doesn't do better than random. What does better than random numerically? It doesn't do better than random in the sense that your fluctuations are still square root of n. How do you see it? Well, look at the grand canonical ensemble. There's a relation between uh, the fluctuations in particle number and your response function, which is the thermal compressibility, and there's a, an n average in front of it. And this means that the square root of this guy, which is a variance, goes like the square root of n. Sorry, equilibrium doesn't do it for you. Okay? There you go. Equilibrium doesn't do it at finite temperature. Zero temperature, good luck. All right? It's even worse if you go to a critical point, because at a critical point, your, your, your compressibility diverges, and in fact, in that case, your fluctuations are not only not square root of n, they're much worse. All right? Yeah, I've made it intensive, yeah, so that's where the n is in front. Okay? Okay, so can I do anything? Right? If I can, then the, the, these things are called um, hyper-uniform if, uh, if you're Sal Torquato, and super-homogeneous if you're uh, these folks over here. Um, hyper-uniform has taken the, taken the day among the condensed matter people because these other guys are astrophysicists. Um, astro, they're astrophysicists, cosmologists. It turns out the universe is hyper-uniform. Isn't that amazing? Just telling you. All right. This is cultural, cultural stuff. All right. Um, now, I'm not going to take you through the calculation. I will tell you, however, you know what two-point correlation functions are? Yes? No? Maybe so? Two-point correlation functions. How do they look? They sort of typically look, right? They sort of typically look like... I'll use that thing, right? I'm assuming isotropy, all right? This sort of goes like 1 over r to some power. We can put exponents in it, 2s, d's, and eta's. I don't want to do that. Times e to the minus r over psi, typically, right? We learn this? We learn this. I can ask John then, and then you're going to be on the next exam. Right? We learn this sort of thing, right? At the critical point, what happens? This guy diverges. This guy is canceled. I get 1 over, the, one over r to the whatever power it is. Okay? Right? That's power law decay. That's called, we physicists usually call it long range. The chemists don't call it that, but it's power law for sure. And uh, hyperuniformity implies power law correlations. But, but, uh, you know, as, but how can that be, right? Because I just said a critical point in ordinary equilibrium has divergent fluctuations, right? How... But now these have diminished fluctuations. How can they both be power law? Right? How can that be? Well, the answer is because there is a negative sign in front of the thing over here. Okay? There's a negative sign for hyperuniformity that kills the fluctuations. Just telling you. Okay? So there you go. So let's just see. I'll show you another model, and then I'll show you why I'm talking about this. Okay, here's another model. I showed you the MANA model. Here's another model. It's a so-called conserved lattice gas, or uh, there are other, other names for it, perhaps. Um, here it is. What I do is, again, square lattice, put particles down, only this time not multiple occupancy, either one or zero. And now, all right, now what I want is I want to get away, again, from my, from my neighbors. I want to get away from my neighbors and... Uh, Activity, then, I have to tell you two things. Activity. You sitting next to me. I don't like that. Okay? I move away to one of my random neighbor sites. Okay? That's what I do 
It's the dynamics that I affect when I identify myself as, 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 as active. Activity, two guys sitting next to each other. What do I do? Move away. Okay? Move to one of the neighboring sites. All right? So those guys are active. Move them away. I still have more active sites, right? Those I have, I have three, active, uh, three pairs of active guys. They move. They move. The last guy, one more. And there you go. Nobody sits next to each other. Life is wonderful again, right? This has the same universality class, by which I mean same critical exponents as the MANA model that I showed you. It happens to be the case, all right? And, uh, and this also is an absorbing state phase transition. This is an absorbing phase right now. If I put in more than 50% now, right, more than half filling, I have to have a, an activity. But once again, the active part, the, the, the phase transition is at much lower densities, even though there are many absorbing states in between the critical point and that wall of a half. Okay? There we go. I just said that. What are this? Okay, so now I say, what are the density flows? So let me just, so, we, so we're wondering, what happens at the critical point? Okay? Well, obviously, it's going to be hyper-uniform, because otherwise, why would I have shown you this, right? Uh, and, so it is hyper-uniform. Let me just show you how, how it is. So, what, so let me just study the, the, the density fluctuations. This is the 1D mana model, okay? Which is the same as the other one, except in one dimension. It's the same thing otherwise. Uh, and I'm, I've done, again, I've plotted out uh, the variance in the density as a, as, as a function of window size, the size of that, not a circle anymore, now it's just a segment, okay? If I'm below critical, right, below critical, I told you there's a critical point, I haven't told you where it is, if I'm below critical, then ultimately, so things start out where they start out, but ultimately the system becomes random. At large scales, the system becomes random. Okay? Which is fine. But then if I look at what's going on at the part I just dismissed, right, the low L fluctuations, it turns out that they are, they, they're, they are parallel to a line that I've drawn over there with a different power larger than one, okay? Therefore, more regular, therefore hyper-uniform, if I were to go all the way down the line over here. And as I make this thing closer to the critical point, it just hugs it. So at the critical point, my system is hyper-uniform. It is still less uniform than a crystal. It is. That is true. It is absolutely less uniform than a crystal, but it's still pretty good, right? Um, okay. That's, that's just a restatement of what I said. I can define a correlation length to be the place where uh, my curve deviates from the, from the low uh, small l behavior, okay? Over here, less than this crossover length, the system is very regular. Above it, it becomes random, if you like, okay? And that's a valid correlation length. That diverges as you approach the critical point, I'm just telling you, okay? Okay. I just, just, just said that, and since I don't want to, the whole point is not to tell you about these systems, about, about the hyper-uniformity, um, I'll just tell you that uh, this works for any number of, of, of models, like the same conserved lattice gas in two dimensions, it works for the mono model, it works for other models I haven't told you about, okay? And uh, it's always the same sort of thing. The exponents are always the same, provided I am in the same space dimension. That's what universality means. Okay? Um, good. I said that. Now, let's go back to what, what, what I'm supposed to be doing, right, in the next two hours. Um, can we learn anything by compre compressing configurations of the system at different values of the density? Can I learn anything from the stuff I've been talking about? Okay. Okay. So let me just define a couple of terms. L is going to be the size of the microstate, by which I mean the number of spins or the number of sites in the square lattice. All right? I'm not talking about continuum things here right now. Okay? Number of sites in the square lattice. Um, script L, 
calligraphic L is the length of the file after I've compressed it using, let's say, LZ77, which is what we typically do. Okay? And I want to define this thing that we decided to give a name to called the computable information density. Computable because you can actually compute it. Um, and I'll call it CID for short. And it's the, it's the average or the expected value, if I look over all the ensemble of microstates, of the length the, the, of, the, of the fraction, of, excuse me, of the, uh, of the quotient of the length of the compressed file to the, to the length of the, of the size of the system, if you like. Okay? Now, and, and, and that's just a, a specific normalization. And let me just see what I get. Two-dimensional mono model, that's what I'm plotting over here. Um, here I haven't normalized it that way. The initial state, right, I've thrown things down, right? I'm throwing a bunch of particles down, right? Multiple occupancy, whatever. Now, as I let, I wait a little while. I let dynamics do what they do, okay? It's a function of density here, right? Each point here is a different run, right? This is low density. This is high density. And what happens after some time, which you can sort of read off about, uh, I don't know, 10 time steps, is that the length of the compressed files, and again, what I'm saying, if I look at a density of 0.3, it starts over here and it goes down. 0.4 starts there and goes down, et cetera, et cetera. Each, each, I have to run this sort of thing for many, many values of the density to get something which looks so nice. I mean, smooth and stuff. Let me, let me run it a little bit longer. So the first thing you can see is something happens in time, okay? I started off in a very random si system, in a very random initial condition, right? I let my dynamics go, and it lowered the entropy, if you want, okay? A little bit more. I keep on going, and look what I see. The critical point in this system is over here. And what you see is that if you wait long enough, you get a cusp. You get a cusp singularity in the information content. So now the question is, can I see something when I, when I look at information of systems out of equilibrium? Well, at least this one I surely can, right? There's a cusp, right? That's wild that there's a cusp. It's not a jump. It's continuous. Its derivative is as a jump, it doesn't, it doesn't means is the same thing you'd expect for a second order transition, right? It's true. A jump here would tell you first order, for example. So the first point I want to make is, at least for this specific model, data compression identifies the critical point in a really, really striking way. It's unambiguous. I mean, you, you just can't argue this. It's unambiguous. And it also says that data compression, right, or the proxy for the Shannon entropy, is a quantity which has, which has real meaning for the system. Okay, I, I've told you many times that you don't know a priori whether the entropy or a proxy for the entropy is a relevant quantity for systems out of equilibrium. And I don't know about all systems in equilibrium, out of equilibrium, big, big class. But here it sure does, right? No question, it has relevance and I can see it. So this gives us hope. Okay, so you can follow the time evolution, you can locate the critical point of the transition, you have a cusp at the critical point, which will tell you that maybe you can classify phase transitions out of equilibrium by the nature of the singularity of the information content of the system as you change your control parameter, be it temperature or density or whatever it might be. Yep. Absolutely, just like that. Cusp showed up, and that's it. Okay? <laughs> you have to ask Stefano Martignani. <laughs> but you could do it either way. That's true. You could do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You could do.
Well, I mean, if you're if if it's if it's not stuck in in, in anything, then it's going to continue to evolve, right? And 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 it's true. No, it wouldn't. Once you come to steady state, it, it, that's what it is, right? The what what? Uh, let me see. Here I go. Um, you know, above to the right of point six, whatever. Okay, those are asymptotic states for which the dynamics never ends, right? So. Okay, let me just, uh, okay, another model. The 1D conser conserved lattice gas. Okay, it's critical. Uh, it, 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 this is a model which people have said was a trivial model because its critical point is at the maximum density point where beyond, where, beyond which I have to have activity. Unlike this, the, the previous thing where it was at, I don't know, 0.6 where I could have gone to 1. Right? But it looks so pretty. Okay? The same thing. This is the, uh, the CID. Okay, this is the time. You can look at the time scans if you like, but I sort of like to look at this better. Okay, the, we put down an initial state of, of, uh, of ones and zeros on a line. Okay, the information content of that, right, Shannon entropy of that, I should say, is minus P log P minus 1 minus P log 1 minus P, where P is, the, is just what I've written as row over here. Okay, that's this guy over here. Okay, that's the initial state. You let the dynamics go, the thing flattens out, ultimately becoming a cusp at a half where it has to be. Okay. The cute thing is, cute thing is, if I look at when, and this is the activity, if you like, okay, the activity is asymptotically zero up to a half, of course, and then it rises in this fashion I showed you before. If I'm in the active on the active side, okay, yeah, probably. How far, far back? Sure. It's the same thing I'm just, I'm just showing basically. Well, I, I haven't normalized it. Yeah. I haven't normalized it, but yeah, it will go to zero, I guess. I have, and I will show it to you in a second. Yeah, yeah. It's, but, I, but, but it's the same. Okay, just to not keep you in suspense. Let me just make, the, yeah, let me make a, a quick point. This is, these are my initial states. They eventually come down, all right, into the, uh, into this blue thing, which is what you get ultimately on the left side of the, in the act, in the absorbing side of the transition, and the red thing, you can't really see, but there's there are blue dots on that side also, all right, um, and that's what you ultimately come to. But let me make one quick point. This is what you'd get. The red guy here is what you would get if you, ra if, you had a r if you randomly generated an absorbing state. Okay? Randomly generated an absorbing state, that's what you would get. But you don't find those. You find these guys. There are fewer of them, right? This is effectively the, the entropy. The number is exponential of the entropy, right? So you're seeing a small fraction of the totality Right? Your accessible states in the system is not all the absorbing states, which it would be if the thing were in thermal equilibrium, right? You're seeing a subset, okay, going all the way down the line, which is, I'll tell you later, just because it, I want to actually finish, I won't finish on time, of course, but, this, but you know, to go through lunch and then having to listen to the street on an empty stomach, Uh, okay, I want to do higher dimensions. So quick, some, some quick technical stuff showing some pictures. If I want to go to higher dimensions, okay, here I showed you how to do this, one, one of these data compression things on a string. What if I have a higher dimensional thing? I already showed you some. What do I do? Well, I do a scan like this, right? I start at the upper left, let's say, scan the first row, carry on back, scan the second row, make a string thereby, right? I can compress that. It works quite well. 
It works quite well, shockingly enough. I was amazed that this worked. That my, so my first fear, of having seen that it works in one dimension, was it's going to get screwed up in two dimensions because I'm losing the, if I do something like this, I'm losing the vertical correlations, or at least I might be losing it. Well, I don't. Anybody have a camera, have a hammer? Sorry? I did, but I didn't tell you how I did it. I did. So you could do this called a raster scan. There's also a rain scan doing it on the on diagonal. I don't want to talk about that, but there's a nice way, right, called the piano Hilbert scan, okay, which is a recursive uh, way of, of making a, uh, a space-filling curve. You can do it in any dimension on, on, on a square lattice of 2 to the n by 2 to the n, by 2 to the n by 2 to the n if you want to do it in higher dimensions, okay? And it looks like this. This has the, has, has the virtue that it sort of respects your local structure more than that other guy does. And it also has the virtue that this, if you apply it to the lempel zeev algorithms, has been proven to be optimal, asymptotically, in the thermodynamic limit. Okay? So that's what we do. 2D mana looks the same. To your question, here's the time dependence. Okay? And if you can't tell the difference, it's because you can't tell the difference. If you look at the activity, the decay of the activity, or if you look at the change in the, in the CID, in the, in the information content, there you go. Okay? It's just the same. I just wanted to show it to you. It's exactly the same. Okay. Reality check. I'm going to try to go fast, because reality is not my strong suit. All right? Reality check. I mean, I show you stuff, and, and, and because you guys are nice, and because I talk forcefully, right? and because I have tenure, and because I'm well-known, right? You believe me, which is really nice of you. And you shouldn't, right? You shouldn't believe your professors. I mean, you should give them the benefit of the doubt, but you shouldn't believe them, right? You shouldn't say, just because one of your, one of your, your thesis advisors says this is so, you shouldn't, you shouldn't you know, say, oh, how wonderful, I don't have to do any more work. And you shouldn't say that's obvious bullshit. All right? There's a middle ground, okay, which is to give the benefit of the doubt and, and to go in and, and, and to check. Be open to the possibility that your advisors are wrong because they very, very often are. If they're anything like me, they're very, very often wrong. And they don't mind that, right? They don't mind that. But if you believe everything they say, you're not going to discover anything because you believe them already. That's a serious comment said in a non-serious way. Reality check, two-dimensional Ising model. I do understand how the entropy is for the 2D Ising model because Ansager calculated it for me, right? Yeah? I don't know if you guys in, 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 in your StatMet course do the 2D solution to the, they do, to the, to, the, uh, to the Ising model, but we have an exact solution, all right? And I'm going to show you the answer. I'm not going to take you through this because I'm already out of time. I will tell you, however, that I need to do some sort of uh, rather sophisticated extrapolation, which is fine. It's okay. It's just that uh, the, okay, it's sort of like the, the, the analog of what's called finite size scaling, um, where what you do is you look at a system for different, uh, of different sizes, and you see where the, 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 the things you're trying to measure or trying to understand are tending to in the, as your systems get larger and larger, you sort of hope it tends to some sort of something sensible. Okay? That's more or less what I'm doing over here, but I'm using some rather sophisticated bounds uh, proved by Savari for, for these data compression things. I'm not going to take you through that right now um, because I just don't have very much time. But if I do that, let me just tell you what I get. All right? So here we go. This is system size. We go up to, I don't know, almost 10 to the 8th by 10 to the 8th, because Stefano's a nut, right? And, uh, you know, I don't know, 500, something like that, down over here. So let's look at the, 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 the small system systems. This is, a, this is what you get for the small system, right? Just to tell you, see the dashed line over here? That's the exact solution for the infinite system. And finite systems are pretty, pretty similar, okay? They don't change very much. So you say, well, all right. Um, it overshoots, but it's a small system. Let's make the system larger and larger 
And then you see it you know, up to here. Now here you have this sort, of, this sort of bottleneck, don't you? I mean, because to get any larger than this, right? Because this is, this is what I told you. It converges as one over log n, right? So I've got to keep on going up from this side. And it's hard to get to 10 to the 28th, right? That would do. That would really do great, but it's hard to do, right? We don't want to do that. Um, so I have to use those extrapolations, those finite size extrapolation schemes. And when I do, I get something which looks like this, okay? There are two different extrapolations we looked at, okay? The red triangles and the, and the purple squares, and you can choose for yourself what you like better, okay? But they really sit very much right on top of, one, of, of the actual answer. And what that's telling us is that you can actually get, you can rely on the, on these, on the, on the, on the technique, Okay? You need to do that. You need to check it for something you know, okay? To verify, to check that what you're doing makes numerical sense. It doesn't just look nice, okay? So you have to work to get it, but nonetheless, working is not a, is not a four-letter word. Work is not a four-letter word. One more discrete, it is, actually. Um, one more discrete model. This is a model that I'm particularly fond of because my name appears on it. Um, it says the following. It's, take a square lattice, I'm just into square lattices today. Take a square lattice, two types of cars, right? Those which go up and those which go to the right or to the left, either way. Okay, the one that goes up could alternatively go down. It, but it, it either goes up or it goes down, not both. It goes up, let's say, and goes to the right. And the other guy goes to the right, let's say, as written. All right? Blue goes up, red goes to the right. I have a global traffic light. Whenever, when, when it's green for the upgoing guys, Every guy which, can, which is not obstructed right now will go up. When all have moved, the light changes, and I do the same thing. And I iterate this again and again. All right, so here's an example. All right, um, yeah. So it's going to go up first. This guy here, oh, and this is on periodic boundary conditions, the way it's done. It doesn't really matter. Okay? This guy is not obstructed. Okay, it's going to go up. This one as well, this one, this one as well. This guy is currently obstructed. It's not going to go. All right? It's, this is so-called parallel updates. I look at the, sy the system right now. I ask who can move right now, and I, and I move in that way. Okay. Now, the guys want to go to the right. All the guys which have gone up, uh, which, can, which can move, have, gone, have moved. Um, the guys which can move to the right is this one, because this, this is an empty space. This one... This one and this one can't because it's blocked. Okay, I do this again and again. Okay, and what I do if I get, if I look at low density, what I get is something like this, which is pretty cool, really, actually. Um, at this point, every single particle, every single car is moving at every single time step. Okay, the average velocity is one in natural units, okay? And that's the spatial structure that you get. It's like, it's like you started off in something random, it somehow works out all its kinks, and every single particle eventually will move at every single time step. Low density. High density. Oops. Okay? That's what happens. It just gets stuck. So it's a jamming transition, if you like. Um, and then you can say, so we said, well, okay, what do, what do we get if we, if we look at the, at, the, uh, at the information content of this, look at the CID of this thing? And so my, my student, Yuval Lemberg, did. And here on the left, so the, the, the critical point is over here, where that I go from flowing to jammed. That's right over here. Okay? These guys are the flowing ones. Right? This is the... CID, the information content normalized to system size. It starts here, goes down, jumps, okay, to the next branch. Jumps means first order transition. We already knew this was a first order transition back when I did this work a long time ago, okay? But now I see that there's an unmistakable signature of first order transition in, in, in this non equilibrium system as well uh, by having a jump in the entropy proxy information content, CID, okay? But then we kept on looking, and you say, oh, well, okay, that's fine, I got this one, this we understood, but look what something's going on over here, which I never noticed, which I never knew about, because I never thought to do this, obviously. 
right? Well, it turns out there's a second phase transition over here. This would say it's second order. It's not a jump, right? It's a kink. And indeed, that's true. And unfortunately, in 1994, a couple of guys found this thing, although they couldn't compute anything with it. I didn't, we didn't know about it, right? We just, after seeing this, we went, I went back and looked to see. And uh, we've been able to calculate various measure, if you like, various critical exponents for, for this transition where none of them had been measured. Okay? But my point here is, if you use this method, you may discover something you didn't know exists. Okay? So you say, well, what's happening over there? Right? What's happening over, you know, from, from going from the red to the blue, I do understand, right? It's a, it's, it's, you saw a uniform state where everybody's moving to a jam state. They were obviously very different. What's happening as I cross over, you know, this point over here? So here are a couple of pictures. This is before I cross, this is before I cross, and now this is after I'm beginning to cross, right, just around there, and this is after I'm on the other side already. So you have a multiplicity, your, your, your jams now have, a, not a single jam, but they're sort of wrapping around in a different, in a different way, and that's the transition, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it's a winding number thing or whatever, but, but, but yeah, okay? Continuum systems really, really, really fast because I'm really, well, I'm not that far over actually, just a little bit over, but I am over nonetheless. Continuum systems, these are all lattice models. We'd like to understand what's going on in, in experiments. Experiments are typically in the continuum. Can you make any sense out of it? Well, for a continuum system, I need eventually to give you a, I need eventually to give you a, a digital thing, which means I have to discretize my lattice, what's called quantization in the electrical engineering literature for their own reasons, okay? I need to know how to do that. That's a bit of an art, okay? But I'll just show you that we have, it's not under control for, for us, not under full control, but we have some idea about what we're doing. So here's a random organization model that Paul Chaikin came up with. Okay, throw points onto a plane, make them into disks with some, some uh, with, 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 give them some, some radius. Uh, it's an absorbing state problem, so I have to tell you those two things. Active means overlapping. Okay, what do I do? I give them a random displacement. That's what I do. The two things I've now told you. And I do this, okay, until I have no overlapping particles. And once again, as a function of density, at low density, I'll have no difficulty coming to an absorbing state. High density, I won't. The same phenomenology as had before. Uh, and the same sort of thing as before. Okay? It's, it, this is... Um, Sri Ram Ramaswamy and uh, Gautam Menon show that this is in the same universality class as the models I've shown before. Okay? And indeed, the numbers are, uh, are, are that way. Just so you can do it here, too, and is what Sri Ram uh, talked about yesterday, and we'll talk about later today, is uh, this is an active system of active Brownian particles. This is a model of Christina Marchetti. Okay? And what the active Brownian particles are is the following. So I have, I, have these, I have these particles, okay? They have a natural velocity, okay? So they go straight, but they have, every now and then, they change directions. If you want, their angle is diffusive, okay? So the, di angle, the direction of motion obeys some sort of a diffusive process, but as long as I don't, until I change that direction, I go straight, okay? With a constant velocity, as a function of density, which is phi in the x-axis, if you look at the black curve is, is what you get after you waited a long time, right? The black curve with all the dots, okay, is what you get after you wait a long enough time. What you can see is at low density, okay, if you take a look at what happened at time zero, which is the yellow, there was basically no change in the information content, okay? At high density, there was a change, and this is actually interesting, but I can tell you about it, why it's going up, you might ask, because over here, the things crystallize, for, for, <laughs> and the crystals break up because they're not amenable to the active, active things, and it's sort of funny, but okay. But at this point, which is a critical point, there's a drop in the information, okay, in the entropy pro proxy. There's a sudden drop showing this is a first order transition. This is the clearest way of seeing that this is a first order transition. Okay? And once again, it shows. What's happening is, um, at low 
concentrations, you have a homogeneous phase. Okay? If you learned about instabilities in thermodynamic phases, right, when you pass through an instability, what happens is the system phase separates often. Okay? And that's what's happening over here. Here this is homogeneous. Here it's not homogeneous. All these guys aggregate together. Okay? And if I go even higher, it just looks like that. And that's what I'm picking out. Okay? And let me just conclude because you guys have been really polite. Uh, <clears throat> let me go over. So what I've tried to tell you is that uh, you can use lossless data compression uh, as, a, as a tool for studying non-equilibrium uh, many-body systems. And there aren't that many tools for studying these things. You can't solve them exactly usually. You really can't. Okay? Uh, you can apply it to experiments because what I can do is, you know, when you, when you take out your cell phone, you take a picture of somebody, right? So your cell phones are, I don't know what they are now. I don't tend to update my cell phone as soon as they come, come out. But even my cell phone is 10 megapixels or something like that, right? 12 megapixels, right? And, and, and that's an enormous number of, right? It's an enormous file size. If you had to store that file size on your phone, your thing would, would start yelling at you after a week that you have no more space on your, on, on your phone, right? Start erasing, right? So they must be doing something. Well, they could be blurring the image. That's possible, but they don't. Okay, what they do is they have a data compression algorithm which compresses the actual, all those 12 megapixels times three because you got three colors, all right? 36 megapixels of data, or mega whatever the hell of data. And, uh, yeah, is that right? Did I say it right? I think so. In any event, um, yeah. And it compresses it to something which is manageable, right, without loss. And if you didn't have that, you, you, you wouldn't be able to carry your phone around and take photographs with it. Flat out. Well, that's true also for, for, for medium and any and high-end cameras, the same thing is true. So if you want to do an experiment, you mount the camera and you take pictures, and you don't even have to look at the pictures. All you got to do is see how large the files are. Okay? So it's, you can actually do, do things with experiment that people do. Uh, Shankar Ghosh at, uh, at TIFR in Mumbai is, is, is doing things like this. Uh, you can use this idea to show typicality in a non-equilibrium ensemble. As I said, you don't know if it's true, but you can ask now. Okay? Uh, you can measure, measure correlations. In fact, we can measure correlation lengths. I haven't gotten into that. It's, 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 it's more than you guys want to know about. But you can measure other things such as correlation lengths, um, such as exponents for critical, critical exponents, which you otherwise can't measure. Okay? Which you otherwise don't know how. Don't, you, you can measure it. Typically, you measure a critical exponent for a correlation length by looking at the correlations of the relevant variable. If you don't know what the relevant variable is, you don't know what to do. Here, you don't have to know. This just gives it to you. Okay? And it's a convenient way of thinking and measuring self-organization and in, in the time dependence thereof. So maybe, maybe, maybe it'll, it'll say we'll be able to use it at some point in the distant future uh, to do things which are more related to, to biology in which everything is out of equilibrium unless it's dead. Right? And I just want to acknowledge Paul Chaikin and Stefano Martignani, uh, with whom I did all the work. And thank you very, very much for, your, for, your, for coming and for being a great audience. <laughs>